the evening before my launch at the 30th of October um, 1985, I was sitting alone uh, just about a few hours to prepare myself, and I was nervous. Nervous not to be afraid, but nervous because of the excitement. Today, just about a few hours ago, I was sitting at home just about an hour alone because I was nervous. I was really nervous because of what I'm going to say. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, the next 18 minutes, I want to give you my idea. I know what it is you don't know yet. <laughs> but I can tell you, your world will never be the same again. You think maybe that you are cosmic. You think maybe that if you look at the skies, at the universe, that you have an understanding of that universe, that you have the right to have that understanding. But I hope that I make clear to you that you're not cosmic at all. In fact, that you are Earth-like. And this is all because of an hypothesis which I postulate. Namely, time is a creation of life in response to gravity. Of course, you, you have to start thinking about what that means. But I help you. I can place that next to a sentence which is well, you know, very well known by you, Descartes, 1637. I think, thus I am. Try this. I live, thus time passes. That blows your mind. Time is a creation by life in response to gravity has an immediate implication, namely that our time is a creation of our life in our Earth gravity. That means that suddenly time becomes something which is ours, and suddenly it becomes basically our fundamental reference of looking everywhere. We are chronocentric. In the same way as the Egyptian thought that the Earth was in the center of everything, we think that our time is the center of everything. We even say that 13.6 billion years ago, the whole universe started. Ago? With respect to what? With respect to our presence, our now. You think universe cares about that? With a different gravity, different life can generate a different time. And it might be that that causes them to look very differently at the cosmos. I think that because we only look to the cosmos only with our time, that we see only a fraction of the universe. And that they think that they see maybe a different fraction and guess what? We don't see each other. Now, wouldn't it be marvelous? Wouldn't it be marvelous to escape out of this chronocentrism in the same way as the people after the Middle Ages escaped out of the geocentrism and suddenly were able to see much more of the universe? Suppose we can do the same. Well, I got all these thoughts because of my space flight. When I went up in the space shuttle, I was pushed down in my seat with three times my body weight accelerated to reach an enormous speed of about 13,000 kilometers an hour. And then eight minutes it took to bring me up in space, to realize that I was extraterrestrial, that I was there where there's no air, where there's 200 degrees minus temperature, where there is no life, where there is no history, where there's maybe nothing which is important. And then looking to the earth and realizing that everything we know, everything of value, all the evolutions of life has taken place there. Of course the life which is developed there is being shaped by the earth. Of course. And if you are in space, then you are Weightless, you don't feel that earth. What it means is you look here at my coverall, which I took off, and you see the invisible wubo sitting inside the coverall. 
There is no force which changes that. And don't mind it is kind of flat because in space you don't have an upside down. In space, when you put a little force on yourself like this here, you move. But you, you sit here in this audience and you feel to your butt, your own body weight, 100 kilograms, 80 kilograms, 65. <laughs> but you don't move. And in space, you move always when you get a certain feeling of force. On Earth, we are developed. On Earth, we have gotten our shape. Humanity has evolved. And we have made in our brain programs to handle the things which we see around us. But some of those programs, they don't work in space because it's so different. Look at my colleague, which I blindfolded, Rainer Fuhrer, and I asked him to point at the ceiling and see what happens. I rotate him and he can't do it. In space, you fundamentally lose the capability to integrate time, to add up the little steps of motion. While on the Earth, this is just absolutely a piece of cake. So I guess that you can imagine that my conclusion of my space flight is it is not space that is unique, it's the Earth. And when the space shuttle went back after 112 times around the Earth, one week in space, the shuttle landed, touched down on the runway, rolled out, came to a full stop, and then sitting in the shuttle, I unbuckled my safety belt and I stood up. And then, wow! I was suddenly sitting in an elevator which was moving up with one G of acceleration. Enormously, what an effect that had. And then I, I looked around and all these other people on the earth which were waiting and said, okay, welcome back, Wubo. And they were all thinking that they were sitting still. I said, come on, I mean, this is acceleration, it goes fast. You know how much 1G is. 1G is a sports car which goes from zero to 100 kilometers per hour in just 3.5 seconds. And of course, if you sit in a sports light like that, you feel pressed against the seat with actually 1G, your body weight, and you see with your eyes, you go fast, 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 fast. It's an enormous impact on you. And that feeling which you feel when you go in this sports car, I felt going straight up. Well, of course, you realize that you can't keep forever with this feeling. It's too exciting. So in fact, what needs to happen is that your brain needs to adapt. You have to get used to it. You can't live this way continuously sitting in a sports car. So in fact, that is true. Your brain has a program developed to cope with this problem of accelerating while you, still, you sit still. I know this because of my first PhD student, Susanna Noy. She did an excellent work, and she explained to me how this works. And I will make a, a drawing of how that works. How that works is you have a head, and you have two ears. And with one ear, you see something which is the acceleration. Behind your ear, you have something which is called the otolith. It is a, it are little stones on hairs that at each acceleration, the stones will give you inertial forces which crunch on the air hairs, and that's what you feel, that's what you notice in your head. Now, your otoliths in your ear, they measure acceleration. They measure acceleration irrespective of whether you are accelerated by gravity, accelerated by a sports car, or in space, accelerated by a rocket. Einstein has said it is indistinguishable. But your eyes see that you don't move. So your eyes, in fact, they are Newton-like. They say, well, I don't move, I'm sitting still, or I'm moving with uniform motion. Like if you sit in a train and you don't look outside, you don't know the difference of the constant speed or standing still. So in fact, if you look at carefully, then you realize 
that here on this side, you have acceleration, which means kilometers per hour per time unit because it changes over time. And here you have kilometers per hour. And now your central nervous system has to make sense out of it. Well, I don't think you need to be a rocket scientist to understand that the central nervous system has to make time. Because the difference between the two units is the time unit. Ergo, the central nervous system makes time. And of course, it's our time. We make it. Yes, of course, because all the people make about the same time, we have made constructions like clocks. But it's still our time. The uh, program which we have, which generates this, let's say, consensus of being accelerated while still see that you don't move, that program is almost perfect. You don't notice that you're not moving. You don't notice the acceleration. You kind of have full comfort sitting still. So that good is that program. But the program has a few little flaws, and, and you can notice that. For instance, if you look at these two lines, and if I rotate them 90 degrees, you suddenly see the vertical line being longer. It's an illusion. And you know when you look at the sun or at the moon and it gets close to the horizon, that it gets bigger. It's an illusion. It's a sign that that program which tries to fool you continuously is not completely perfect. But it is good enough to fool all our scientists, all our philosophers, all our thinkers who want to look to the outside and they don't realize that they are fooled by their brain. Let's do a very fundamental experiment. That is measuring the speed of light. As you might know, a little over 100 years ago, we made a very important discovery. The speed of light is always the same, irrespective of how you measure it. Can you imagine how weird that is? I mean, you take a star and you look at that light and you measure here the speed. It is 300,000 kilometers a second. And then you go and sit in a fast airplane, you fly towards the star, you measure the speed of light, and it is exactly the same. Looks like it almost doesn't make sense. But it is true, you can do the physics experiment, and it is exactly what happens. And Einstein was the first who took that seriously and says, OK, no emotion, no misbelief. Why not just take in the calculation? And just on a two-page article in 1905, he proved E equals mc squared, the basis of the nuclear energy. Just because the speed of light was found to be constant. So let's do the experiment. In fact, what I'll take is I take a laser gun on one hand, I take a stopwatch on the other, and conveniently, I point the laser to the direction of the moon. The moon, why? Because the moon is at a convenient distance. It is 385,000 kilometers from here. Light goes about 300,000 kilometers per second. So it takes a little longer than a second for that light pulse to reach the moon. Fortunately, on the moon, some of my colleagues of Apollo 11 have placed there a reflector, a laser refractor. That bounces back the laser pulse, which then comes back to me, and then clunk. And there I go, I have two and a half seconds. I have measured the speed of light. I hope you can still see it. I will put this in front. I have measured the speed of light, C, it is normally called. And on the upper line, I have two times 385,000 kilometers. That's the distance to the moon and back. And on the lower side, I have two and a half seconds. So what? Well, with the hypothesis we are dealing with now, this distance might be something which is universal or cosmic or whether you want, whatever you want to call it. But the two and a half seconds are ours. And suddenly you see here the proof that the speed of light is in fact ours. It is our specific speed of light because time has created by life in response to our gravity. Wow. 
but wait a minute. I say, wow, because as a physicist, people don't talk that way. But as a philosopher, what I've been saying is not all that strange. In fact, Heidegger already said that being and time determine each other reciprocally. In other words, being causes time and time causes being. So it's not new for a philosopher that you say that we make time. In the physiology I just showed to you, like uh, my PhD student, Susanna Noy, it is not at all strange to assume that we have to make time in our brain. In fact, you could do experiments and show it that we make time. But the real thing which we need to do is to get physics on board. Because the physicists still believe that time is universal. The time is something outside. If we all die, time is still there. With the today's hypothesis, we combine physics with physiology, and the philosophers, they agree. Yes. For the physicists, because they love formulas, if you want to imagine that you accelerate while you don't go up, there's only one solution. You're in a chiral cell. You rotate. This is your rotation time. The speed of light divided by gravity. And very conveniently, this is about one year, so not so bad with respect to the human life. Where does it lead to? Where does this thinking lead to? What kind of conclusions can you draw? And they're really daring, like the first one. I told you the speed of light is ours. And I started to mention that a little over 100 years, people were so surprised to see that the experiments would always show the same speed of light. But sorry, of course that is true, because it's ours. It's our life. We have calibrated all our clocks. That's why the speed of light is constant, irrespective, because it's life, what you see. Then I have a disappointment for the uh, astron astronomers and astrophysicists, because as we see only a small fraction of the universe, the limit of our visibility is in fact the end of the universe which we see, which is called the edge of the universe or the Big Bang. And apparently that then is also an illusion. And maybe you could even say that that small fraction which we see or the big fraction which we don't see, that explains the dark matter and the dark energy. I was going to say it is 95% today, I heard it is 96%, and I bet you, in a few years, it will be 98%. Another puzzle which is there over the last decades is how you unify the gravitational theories with the quantum physics. Gravitational theories, if you want, you can write them down as formulas with T always in there, T being time. You do the same with quantum physics, you have quantum physics, and very often you put in T as the explaining the cause of how the probabilities evolve. But now, in that gravity versus time, there's where is the problem. Because that time is not independent of gravity. We make it. So time is, in fact, a function of gravity. So why not substituting that into all the formulas of quantum physics? And what you end up is you eliminate time. Suddenly, you have a formalism in which you have quantum physics expressed in gravity as facts, as a frozen universe. But the most important conclusion is that if we are managing to get out of this chronocentrism, if we get beyond this paradigma, then we might see extraterrestrial life. I would like to place that just in a context of history. I already said, 2,000 years ago, we thought the Earth was in the center. One minute. We learned after the Middle Ages that the Earth was not in the center, but the Sun was in the center. And now, around 1900, we learned that the speed of light was constant, and that we just learned how to put our time in the center. And now I'm inviting you to lose chronocentrism. 
in the same way as Dali's picture. Throw away this time reference and start thinking and imagining what could happen beyond. I think it's getting time to put in a disclaimer. <laughs> I could be wrong. I could be totally wrong. But wouldn't that be sad? Wouldn't that be really sad? But because can you imagine that with this new thinking, thousands of young people can use their brains and imagination to work the formulas out? Hundreds of technicians could work out new technologies, new instruments, new telescopes, new computers, whatever you can find. And then suddenly with all this investment which we put together globally, we have set up this large experiment where press will sit, well, scientists will sit like in a mission control room, a big screen, and in front of the big screen you have the principal investigator looking at the screen and turning on the experiment of humanity. And he looks at the screen, and then he's going to see for the very first time signals of the external intelligence. Suddenly realizing that this whole universe is vastly filled with life. Suddenly realizing that there's a new hope for humanity beyond the boundaries of the earth. Suddenly putting everything we had before in a very different perspective. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't that be really wonderful? Wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs>